it's a lot less about engineering now and a lot more about implementation. And I've heard some folks use a term called implementation science. I think you're going to hear a lot more about that over the next five years is who are the people that know how to take the information coming out of the black box and say, I know what to do with this. So it's not necessarily how do I build the next black box anymore? I think it's understanding what to do with that information. Welcome to the Big Unlock Podcast, your leading source for insights and best practices on the digital transformation of healthcare. Join host Patty Patmanaban, CEO of Demo Consulting and best-selling author of Healthcare Digital Transformation, how consumerism, technology, and pandemic are accelerating the future in conversation with healthcare and technology leaders. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox. Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to my podcast. This is Patty, and it is my great privilege and honor to introduce my special guest today, Jim Beinleck, Vice President and Chief Data Information Officer for Penn Medicine in Philadelphia. Jim, thank you so much for setting aside the time, and welcome to the show. Great. Thanks for having me. You're most welcome. You're most welcome. So, Jim, why don't we start with maybe getting a little bit of a background on your role at Penn Medicine and uh, what that entails. Sure. So there are chief analytics officers, chief data officers, and uh, I happen to be a, a chief data information officer, which generally means anything related to data and analytics for Penn Medicine really kind of falls under my purview. I know some organizations have a separation between the folks that provide the IT and technology around data from the folks that really, you know, have analysts and and some folks that are using the data. I have a little bit of both of those areas. If that gives you a little bit of a sense for how we're organized, we, we certainly have informaticists and analysts that reside in our um, clinical and business departments, but we have a pretty uh, sizable data analytics center, about 75 plus people. That's a pretty sizable uh, team, 75 plus people. And I will come back to that in a minute and we'll talk a little bit more about the work that your group has been doing at Penn Medicine. Before we go there, I just wanted to get your high level thoughts on the current state of data and analytics, specifically the maturity levels of data and analytics programs in healthcare and health systems in particular, and how it stacks up against other parts of the economy. So if you could just give us kind of an overview of where you think we are as an industry. Sure, so I think in general, if you look at healthcare, there's lots of opportunity. It's probably the, the best thing I can say to describe it. There's a lot of progress, I think, in pockets, but you know, healthcare generally lags other industries when it comes to any kind of new technology. You know, if you look at what's happened with consumerism, internet, things like that, it's pretty typical for other industries to kind of be out in front. And I think that's generally the same experience with, with analytics and healthcare. I do think it's interesting. I've been involved in in analytics and healthcare for over 25 years. And it's interesting to me that we still struggle with some of the same issues that have been around since then. Certainly the technology has changed, but things around standardization and governance and people just knowing what's available. So the education and that communication component around data and analytics, there's always the, how do I get the right data to the right person at the right time? I still think generally that's the state of the industry in healthcare is trying to get trying to get our arms around everything that's out there and how do you get it to the right person? Yeah, and healthcare also has had this unique challenge when compared to other industry sectors and in the challenge of data interoperability ever since we digitized medical records starting about 10 years ago or so. And it's interesting we're having this conversation now because this week the CMS final ruling on interoperability goes into effect. And hopefully we are going to see much more smooth flow of data with information blocking being being addressed and so on and so forth. Do you want to comment on that uh, briefly? 
Yeah, I think it's a good thing. Being able to more easily share data can always can always be good. I think the challenge is going to be what you alluded to a little bit is how do you balance that against privacy and security? Because those two terms loom large over data and then data sharing. And we're always trying to balance those two things. And it's definitely a challenge. Yeah. So let's come to Penn Medicine. Penn is a very unique institution, the first hospital in the country and a very old and highly regarded educational institution and a research institution. So I imagine your role cuts across all of these dimensions, right? Hospital, you're an educational institution and you're a research institution. How does your work get allocated among these three aspects of the institution's work? We actually see it as an integrated role. To us, they're just different customers. The one thing that that binds them all is access to data, and much of it is access to patient records. That's kind of the core of what we do as an institution, whether it is the research, training new physicians, or running hospitals, ambulatory centers, and clinics. At the core, it's access to data. So that actually makes our job a little bit easy. We don't try to behave any differently if we're working with the researchers versus working with our executives running hospitals. Maybe you could share with us a couple of your uh, important data and analytics programs that you've been driving in the last couple of years or so, just so that our listeners can get a sense of what's priority or what's considered uh, high focus at Penn Medicine today from your standpoint. Yeah, so I can talk about a couple of things just in general. And you know, then if you want me to go into a couple of use cases, I can certainly do that as well. I don't think we're unique In this regard, we did traditional analytics for a long time. And to us, traditional analytics, I think, means taking information from a variety of systems. Healthcare is a pretty complex business, and it's a lot of little businesses kind of rolled up into one. And so it's not unusual to have applications from a variety of different vendors for different uses, whether it's a lab system, a radiology system, ordering, scheduling, and the list goes on. We have hundreds of applications. And so how do you manage and synthesize all of that data when it's coming from so many different places? And for years, healthcare organizations have pumped all that information into a giant clinical data warehouse to link it all together and make it usable. And that's what we did for a long time. I think what's changed is one, the volume of data that we're dealing with, whether it's just through organic growth or the internet of things, certainly medical devices are pumping out data like crazy these days. That old model of let's just put everything in one big warehouse and then we'll we'll have a group of people that can somehow get it out <laughs> exactly mm-hmm. the way we need it. Yeah, that, that model really started to falter, I think, in the past couple of years, just because of the acceleration in, in data and what people are trying to do with data. It also doesn't do a great job of providing for any kind of self-service. And so then your technical folks become a bottleneck to unlocking data that you need for research just to run your organization and things like that too. So we've been moving to the cloud and a lot of the cloud-based tools in order to do that, moving to some different data models and structures, trying to leverage data lake just to open up and unlock the self-service pieces has been really important for us as well too. So that's in general what we've been doing. Do you want me to talk about a couple of use cases? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I will come back to the data question, but yeah, I would love to hear a couple of use cases too. So I'll give you a couple of different ones just to provide some balance. So in our primary care service line, so that's all of the you know, frontline primary care doctors that have practices and they're managing patients. And in many cases, trying to manage chronic diseases, whether it's diabetes, hypertension, folks with cardiac issues, and they depend highly on control of those patients and their conditions. So for our a diabetes population, making sure you've got patients that have well well-controlled A1C and hypertension, it's blood pressure control. Geez, how do you manage that? And, And so we use our electronic medical record data to define those populations. And then whether we are calculating metrics or providing scorecards to 
our primary care service line leaders, they have folks in there too that are really good with data and trying to understand where do we have challenges around certain populations and they're interacting with data that we get from our payers as well too, because they've got information about a patient population and, and who's gotten their A1C levels checked and who hasn't, who's doing a good job of controlling their blood pressure, who's not, patients that may be on statin medications. You know, there's that old saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. And I think this is a good example of that. So we have some pretty neat little scorecards that that team uses to figure out where they have some practices and some physicians that have patients that for whatever reason, they might be struggling. And then they can get involved in understanding what some of those challenges may be with some of those patients. And, you know, in some cases, maybe the patients need some education, maybe they need some home care visits, additional screening, whatever the case may be. But you can't identify any of those interventions if you don't have something as simple as a dashboard or a scorecard that tells you how things are going. Another example, a little bit of a different one is we use a, a third party vendor to help us optimize our chemotherapy infusion schedules. Chemotherapy infusions are not a 15 minute office visit. In some cases they can last the better part of a day. And so it's pretty complicated and there's some testing that has to happen with patients. They have to be ready to receive their treatment and so those schedules are very closely managed and watched. And as well as we try to do to put together what we think is an optimized schedule, because if you want to see as many patients as you can, obviously, to get them their treatments as quickly as you can and make sure that they happen when they're supposed to happen. We have a third-party vendor that's got some machine learning algorithms, and you feed the proposed schedules to the vendor. They have some ways to go through there and try to optimize those schedules so that you're you know, using all of your available chemo bays and you're stacking patients up so that you're, you know, utilizing as much of that capability as you possibly can. And they give us back an optimized schedule and it's worked out tremendously. And um, that's a real good example of some advanced use of data yeah. through machine learning. Those are both very interesting case studies, Jim. And uh, I want to dig into that a little bit. So when you set up these uh, programs, now, what are typically the challenges that you face? Is it at the data end? Is it at the end of uh, the algorithms and trying to get them to improve their accuracy rates? Is it something else? Is it getting people to adopt them? Is it you know, getting it into the workflow of the clinician without being disruptive? Can you talk to me about some of that? What, what are the challenges you have to overcome? Yeah, so inserting this back into the workflow, I think, is the number one challenge for a lot of things related to data, whether it's predictive analytics, whether it's machine learning, whether it's something as simple as managing the blood pressure and hypertension information that you're getting back. I think the question always is, what are you doing with the information you're getting back? Because if you're really not able to move the needle based on the information you get, then you have to question the value of it and the energy that goes into producing it in the first place. But I think in these cases, we have been able to determine the value of certainly the schedule optimization for chemotherapy. You could pretty pretty quickly see the results of a program like that and know that it's working. I think that's the key is when you can see demonstrated results around some of these things. It's definitely a challenge and it requires human intervention. None of this stuff happens because we got a file back from a vendor and somehow you magically inserted it into one of your IT systems and everything got better. It's usually still a fair amount of work by a human to take some of this information and really figure out how do I change my operations? How do I tweak my operations to make a difference? What about the data quality side of it? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so data quality, I think, think is probably the foundation for any one of these programs, because at the end of the day, if people don't trust the data, they don't trust the results out of any of these kinds of systems or technologies. I think, especially with predictive analytics now and data science, a lot of that's a black box to a lot of people. You know, unless you're somebody who's really super into statistics and some of the advanced things that you do with machine learning, it's a little bit confusing to folks to understand what happened with our data. <laughs> you know, it went into this black box and came out and the box says we should do something different. And so 
if you trust the data, you can at least be confident that the results you're getting back are based on good data, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And if you put good data in, you get good data out. There's still some challenges with understanding maybe what happened to the data when it went into the black box. But if there's any kind of question about the quality of the data, man, that's a really tough problem to overcome because once you lose that trust and confidence in the quality of that data, it's really hard to get that back. So we work really hard to ensure the data that we're putting into any of these systems is as clean as it can be. And that takes a lot of work from a lot of people. Um, it's part of the reason why I have 75 people in a data analytics center is because of the amount of work that has to go into ensuring that data quality. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox. I read a report recently where uh, uh, someone had analyzed the FDA approvals for uh, software as a medical device kind of programs. And there was a lot of questions around the uh, data sufficiency, the data quality, and just the black box nature of the whole thing. And to your point, right, the black box nature of these advanced analytics programs, specifically AI, ML kind of programs, at one end, it's a loss of confidence issue. And at the other end, it's actually even more serious. It's issues related to uh, unintended consequences like uh, discriminations and other kinds of biases that creep in if you don't have the right kind of data and you don't have the right kind of algorithms applying, being applied on the data as well. How do you go about, you know, broadly speaking, you would call this the ethics in the use of AI, I guess. How do you go about adjusting for those in addition to ensuring that the algorithms and the data themselves are doing the job they're supposed to do in the first place? So we have these discussions fairly often. What responsibility do we have to our patients to ensure that we are ethically using the data that they generate by virtue of just doing business with us, right? So on one hand, patients generally seem to be pretty interested in making sure that you're sharing data appropriately when you're in the context of providing care to them, which makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, not very many patients, at least according to a survey I just saw not too long ago from Mayo Clinic, want you to hide information from other caregivers and you know, they, they really do want you to share it. But where folks seem to get a little bit nervous is what's happening to my data that I may not be completely aware of. If you've ever signed one of those you know, user agreements. <laughs> they, they can be kind of tough to read, right? So yeah, I, think I know. <laughs> we spend a lot of time talking about how do we better educate and communicate to our patients so that they know what they're consenting to. And I know we're very careful about what happens to data outside the care processes, if it's for research purposes and things like that. There are very strict protocols about what you can use that data for or not use it for. And at the end of the day, patients can opt out if they don't want their data used for anything other than the, their direct care. So there have been a couple of cases in the news over the past year with Google and you know now it's Amazon, Microsoft. Those big tech companies, they do a lot with data and they have a lot of really powerful platforms that deal with data. And so as you see them getting into the healthcare game, that creates, I think, anxiety for folks. Yeah, and I think we're going to see some more complexities emerge as a result of the interoperability final ruling, which includes the information blocking clause, which now says that patients can get access to their own data. And now they're in a position to share it directly with anyone they choose. And there's a real risk uh, that they are not going to be aware of the second order and third order effects of what they're doing. So to your point, you know, you're sharing the data with somebody for a specific use, but if the fine print says that they can pass it on to another entity for use in a different way, then you've lost control completely. So I think we are going to see some interesting developments around that. But I want to go back to some of the work that you've done. And I know, Jim, you and I have talked about this before. You've done some work uh, in genomics, for instance, the genomic data, which arguably can make a significant difference to how you diagnose and treat someone for a complex condition and bring about positive healthcare outcomes. But there's also some ethical considerations that you've uh, thought through. Can you share for the benefit of our listeners how you've gone about uh, harnessing genomic data in particular? 
and you know illustrate some of the ethical guardrails that you bring about in doing that. Sure. So talk about it in, in kind of two levels. And so one is, I think we still may be one of only two healthcare organizations in the in the U.S. that has integrated genetic and genomic testing into the electronic medical record. So for a subset of our cancer patients now, we're sending samples out to labs to have some genetic testing done because of the nature of the treatment for those patients. And we are electronically receiving back results of that testing and inserting that into the electronic medical record. That's a little bit unique. Many times genetic labs will send back a PDF report with the results of the testing, and you've got to have somebody who really understands genetics to translate that report. We're able to get now an electronic result back from a lab, put it right into the electronic medical record, automatically send a notification to a genetic counselor, and then ultimately to the physician that's taking care of the patient with the results of that testing, kind of in plain English, if that makes sense, genetic testing results can be can be kind of complicated if you're not a geneticist. Yeah. And so how do you translate that for a regular physician or somebody who's not really, you know, an expert in genomics? And so we may get some testing results that come back that says, hey, this patient has particular variants in these genes. And so this particular treatment that you might ordinarily offer as a first attempt to a patient with this condition that patient is likely to not respond to that particular treatment. And here are some alternative treatments that you can offer. So, you know, we're in the early stages of doing that, but we're doing it to treat real patients using genetic information. So that's kind of the, I think that's one of the real high hopes for the use of data and genetics in healthcare is precision medicine. And you're now able to tailor a treatment for me and my particular disease that really is geared towards me based on my genetic makeup. And that's that's huge. You know, we touched on it earlier. It's having the ability to do the science is there. How do I take it and then insert it into operations and into the workflow mm-hmm. to really make a difference? And I think that's the thing we're doing now. What is a little challenging around that, though, is, you know, a couple of things. One is those genetic counselors are fantastic. They really understand what that testing means and what it means to a patient, the patient's treatment. So, you know, there's some conversations that have to happen person to person. You certainly don't want genetic testing results automatically being released to a patient because they may not fully understand what they mean. Some patients may say, if you're going to do some genetic testing on me, I want to know what the results are for my particular condition that you're treating me for. But if you find other things during that testing, I don't want to know. So yeah. people like that. My wife is like that. She would rather not know some of those things. And so you have to be able to respect that for each patient. And if you think about it, if a patient has a particular genetic variant or predisposition to some kind of a disease, theoretically, people in their family could also have that same condition. And so how do you deal with that if the patient doesn't want to know the results? And those results may ultimately point to some risk for other people in a family. I think those are some of the dilemmas that over the next three, five, seven years, healthcare organizations are going to have to work through. How do you deal with some of these questions and some of these ethical issues that didn't exist in the past? This is certainly the next frontier uh, of development as far as medicine goes. Let's uh, switch gears a little bit. In this uh, podcast, we talk a lot about digital transformation and specifically about digital front doors, digital patient engagement, and things related to that, telehealth and so on. So from your perspective, Jen, how do you use data and analytics firstly to drive better patient experiences, better patient engagement through all of these new digital tools? And at the same time, how do you also integrate the data that's emerging from some of these newer technologies like telehealth platforms, for instance, how do you take them back into your patient record and sort of mingle them with your electronic health record and CRM data and everything else? Can you talk a little bit about that purely from a digital front door, digital patient engagement standpoint? Sure. So I have a couple of examples that might help understand how we're doing that a little bit better. So one of them I always find pretty interesting just because of some of the technology we're using. And this is around post-surgical follow-up for patients. If you take any number of patients that have surgical procedures, 
you can pretty much bucket them into low, moderate, or high risk for follow-up. And so a lot of that is driven by how the procedure went, what the procedure was, some of the patient's information upon discharge. And so, you know, ultimately you leave the hospital and you go home. I think the question is, is a particular patient then kind of low risk once they they go home, moderate or high, and what do you do about that? Not every single patient needs to be brought back into the clinic or to the hospital for a post-surgical follow-up visit. And so that's one of the things that we found. That's a big dissatisfier, particularly if you're a a city-based hospital like we are. It it is not trivial to get into the city to get to an appointment. It's the traffic, the parking, all of those things then become barriers to patients actually showing up for their follow-up visits, which is a bad thing, right? You want them to follow through on those visits. And so we're able to take data and stratify patients and take our low-risk population in particular and say, for the most part, those people can get a remote follow-up. And in some cases, the remote follow-up is really just a phone call. It doesn't even have to be a, a video visit. And so we have some ways of determining you know, whether a patient is more appropriate for a phone call. If they really do need a video visit, we can set those up. It reduces the travel for the patient. It reduces the risk they're not going to show up for the appointment. It certainly lowers their frustration because of parking and all that kind of thing. So we've had great success using some of that software to do remote follow-ups for the surgical patients. Some of that population, particularly our cardiac population, they they generally don't fall into the low-risk category after they have procedures. And so for some of them, we will send Bluetooth-enabled kits to their home, and it helps monitor certain things around their condition that we want to be able to keep an eye on, but you obviously can't keep people in the hospital forever monitoring them. We have a monitoring center that gets those results real time over an interface through Bluetooth and, um, you know, in a patient's home, just like you would for your phone or anything else. You know, if we need to follow up with a phone call to see how a patient is feeling or doing based on what we're seeing, we can do that or we can deploy a home care nurse. So we're really trying to get the right care to the patient at the right time. And then ultimately, if we think they need to come back to the hospital, we can do that. But we try not to have that be step one if that's not really needed. Yeah. What about the access side of the operation? Do you, how do you use data analytics to improve access to provide uh, more seamless experiences, if you will? I think like a lot of other organizations, we've tried to leverage a um, patient portal, which allows people to check in remotely. You can pay your co-pays remotely. You can make appointments remotely. And with COVID, we certainly have have really accelerated some of those things. We call it a low-touch program where we're trying to figure out how do you leverage technology and engage the patient remotely as much as possible to limit the amount of contact they have to have with people when they show up for appointments. That's really made a big difference, I think, over the past year in trying to figure out how to leverage a lot of technology we already had. But again, it's operational piece, really trying to make that work so that the workflow matches what the technology can do. That's been the biggest difference is just taking some things that we already had, but really accelerating the deployment of some of those technologies. So I want to touch upon a couple other topics really briefly here. We've seen a lot of data collaborations emerging in the market in the last couple of years or so. You mentioned Mayo Clinic. Mayo signed this big contract with Google and it's public information. And they're going to be, uh, uh, Google's going to be analyzing all of Mayo's data in the cloud and then uh, returning the uh, insights back to Mayo for improving healthcare outcomes, for improving the, the practice of healthcare and medicine. We also have seen other kinds of collaborations emerge. There was one that was announced recently, it's called TrueBeta, where a handful of health systems have gotten together, they're gonna pull their data, they're gonna set up a whole new data repository on which they're gonna run advanced analytics algorithms and return the insights back to the participants in the consortium, possibly even outside the consortium. So. What do you make of these developments? Is this the way of the future that you're going to have to come together and scale in order to be able to really move the needle in terms of outcomes to make it more cost effective? What do you think is driving some of these and what do you see as the next stage of evolution of these? 
Well, I don't know if you saw the one that was just announced between IBM and Cleveland Clinic. Yes, the quantum thing. Yes, I did see that yeah. too. Yeah, I, I think you're just going to see more and more of this. If you take, you know, those big platform companies like Amazon and Google and Microsoft, I think the thing they bring to the table, and you referenced it a little bit, is scale. They will always have more compute resources than a place that even as big as Penn is from a healthcare perspective, we'll never have the scale that those big platform companies do. And even if you look at their human capital, I'm guessing that they have thousands of people you can consider some sort of a data scientist. And again, as big as Penn is, we'll never have thousands of people that, that are data scientists. And so the question is, how are we leveraging companies with that kind of power to take what is very complex data and very complex problems, whether you're talking about the genome, machine learning, data science, how do you leverage those two things to try to accelerate any kind of research, discovery, just making healthcare better? The challenge is those are not traditional healthcare companies. And so when you're yeah. talking about data, something as simple as HIPAA, which I think most people no people have signed that agreement now that most patients just understand what that means. You know, a lot of folks may not realize that those platform companies are not healthcare entities. And so they're typically not covered by HIPAA. And so sharing healthcare information with them, they're not covered under that agreement. And that presents some challenges, I think, not just for now, but into the future and what that might look like. Um, we talked earlier about the whole trust issue and ethics around data I think this is where it really starts to bump up. It's a great thing that you want to work with a big tech company to try to leverage the power that they have in their platforms and their people, but you have to balance that against, geez, do my patients really know I'm sharing their data with an Amazon or Google or Microsoft and are they okay with that or not okay with that? Um, the intentions may be good. You're trying to make things better for everybody, but there could be unintended consequences of some of these things. But I do think it's the wave of the future. It's, it's hard to imagine that you wouldn't be leveraging the power that some of those platforms can bring to the table. Yeah, I agree with you there. Now, Jim, a lot of people listening to this podcast are going to be from health systems that don't have the, the scale and the resources of Penn. And they may be going, okay, this is great. You know, Jim's got a team of 75 analytics professionals. We don't even have a data and analytics function in our health system, or we have a really small one. We can't, can't even dream of doing some of the things that Jim is doing. So based on your experience with Penn, and based on what you've seen with your pure health systems, what is the one piece of advice or best practice that you would like to share with others who may feel that you know, they're not a Penn and therefore they're not, they're not going to be able to do any of the things that you're doing? I think recognizing that they may actually have access to a lot more power than, than they're even aware of. Even at Penn, some of the things that we used to do on our own, because we do have resources at our, at our disposal to help do things, whether it's data science, advanced analytics, a lot of this capability is being built right into the electronic medical records right now. And so there are predictive analytics models that are available that you don't have to build on your own. Anybody who's doing anything with cloud will probably be aware. There are a lot of services that are built right into the cloud platforms now that in the past, you would have had to hire some pretty advanced developers or data science people to develop. But a lot of those tools now are being built right into the platforms. I think the secret is, do you have people that know how to use them and know what to do with the results that come out of that? It's a lot less about engineering now and a lot more about implementation. And I've heard some folks use a term called implementation science. I think you're going to hear a lot more about that over the next five years is who are the people that know how to take the information coming out of the black box and say, I know what to do with this. So it's not necessarily how do I build the next black box anymore? I think it's understanding what to do at, with that information. So my advice to anybody would be talk to your electronic medical record vendors, talk to your cloud vendors, understand what tools are already available to you that you don't have to hire highly technical staff to build. It's already there. That is fantastic advice. Well, Jim, thank you so much for that really, really interesting conversation. Yeah, I look forward to following all the work that you're doing at Penn Medicine. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it, Patty. 
We hope you enjoyed this podcast. You can reach us at info at thebigunlock.com with your feedback and questions. This podcast is brought to you with the support of our partners, Innovacer and Powbox.